So I realized there's a real advantage in speaking before Patrick Byrne, because everybody is here to hear him. But now you get to hear me, so it works. It's a good strategy. It's very nice to be here. We've all lived through 2017 together, and you might have noticed, I have, that Bitcoin has been in the news, actually. You probably noticed this. Um, I picked up The Economist magazine last, uh, a couple of days ago. If that's all you read, you'd know one thing for sure. Bitcoin is dead. It's dead. Once again, declared dead, right? The, the, the hodlers in the crowd love it when the press says this. It's always fun. The most fun times are when the Bitcoin crashes and the press freaks out. It's pretty interesting. I'm always getting calls. Every time, the, every time the, the exchange ratio, I like to call it the exchange ratio, dollar exchange ratio rather than the price. But every time the dollar exchange ratio falls, I get panic calls from the press because they want to hold me to account for this. And they want to grill me. And it's getting boring, actually, because I always usually give the same spiel. I just kind of, <laughs> it makes me laugh. And, and uh, I just kind of wink. And it's very difficult to take these interviews seriously. And the press is always like, well, what do you say to the person who bought at the high and, 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 and is now panicked and lost all their money? And you know, I always just say, look, I'm personally responsible for all the losses in the crypto community since about 2013. So just, that's just the way it is. I'm sorry, there's a human tendency to buy high and sell low. And that's just, I, I don't know. What are you going to do? It's not my fault. I didn't do that. Anyway, what I'd like to do today, because I'm sure it's like, like you probably all feel this. When there's a big story in Barron's or Newsweek or on CNN or somewhere about Bitcoin, it's a little like reading about your cousin or your brother or something like that. You don't know what they're going to say. And if they say bad things, it kind of makes you feel bad. You're like, hey, leave Bitcoin alone, right? But sometimes I find that people in our community don't always know how to respond. So in the very few minutes I have here today, I, I would like to uh, go back to fundamentals to talk about some of the things that trip people up most commonly about crypto assets in general and Bitcoin in particular. Because I find that actually, though we have the world's most intelligent uh, people in, this, in our community, not everybody is well-schooled in sort of uh, economic fundamentals to understand uh, some, some, some uh, core theoretical and historical realities behind, behind what makes it valuable, what makes it important, and why the crypto assets and crypt the cryptocurrency in general are going to own the future for the rest of our lives, okay? So there are three, three common misconceptions. Uh, the first one is, is the most silly, which is that you are all deluded. This entire conference is some sort of weird hoax. Every business in this space is a scam, and we're all just living a weird illusion. And and we're going to wake up and find that it's all going to fall to pieces, and we're going to feel extremely stupid. And our children will talk about it. You know, you believe when dad went for that whole, what was it called, crypto thing? That was embarrassing, right? <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> but you know what, I mean, it's amazing. Some of the finest minds at Wall Street today believe this. Some of the most successful investors over the last 30 years believe this. Some of the smartest people I know are still writing me emails every day. I just want to give you a heads up that you have fallen for a hoax. If you, if you know your history, they always say, uh, you will know that this is just, uh, you know, it's just a ridiculous, it's not just a bubble. It, it's just a, a scam from top, top to bottom, you know? So, I don't know what to say about that. You know, it's very interesting to me that you have very smart people, very smart people, successful entrepreneurs, very successful investors. You all have brokers, right? Um, you know, like an old-fashioned account at Merrill Lynch or some like, like wherever. 
you call up your broker who's, who's guided you for years, you call him up and you kind of let, let him know that you found another, another way to invest, you know? And you get a lecture. Well, you know, I wouldn't uh, recommend that. That's, uh, you, that's gonna be, that's gonna lead to problems, you know. The people I talk to say, this is not the way to go. Anyway, so that's one. I don't want to say that. You know, it's a new technology. Not everybody understands it. It's proof that not, sometimes the smartest minds are not able to keep up with the newest thing. That's probably been true since the 12th century when the horseshoe was invented, you know? Oh, this horseshoe is never going anywhere. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Eyeglasses, come on. Cotton ginning, never gonna work. So there's that. The second one's a very interesting one. A little more sophisticated. They say that the, the current uh, market valuations of crypto assets are purely speculative, which is to say that people are expecting the prices to rise and the, 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 the uh, expected future valuations are being discounted to the present and don't really represent uh, a, a, a present uh, value that is, that is uh, tangible. Okay, uh, to this I say that's true. Okay, it's just true. But you know what? There's no market good or service for which that is not true. Everything is a speculation. Life is a speculation. Everything you buy, everything you, you go to the movies, you're speculating that the movie's gonna be good. You're sometimes wrong, it sucks, you have to walk out, you regret it, right? You buy a, a, a pair of tennis shoes, you expect that they're going to work and help you bounce around on the tennis court or whatever and be really fashionable, whatever. And it's especially true with financial assets. There's no existing price of any financial asset that is not speculative because life is speculative because, and this is weird, it's a weird truth, no one knows the future. No one knows it. It's just, we look through the, gla uh, through the glass darkly as St. Paul said, right? We just don't see perfectly, so we're all speculating, and we're competing with our speculations, and that's what markets are about. They're about f price discovery, figuring out what the future is going to look like and discounting it to the present. Okay, a third one is interesting, um, and it's probably one that some of you in this room have said, when people ask why is Bitcoin valuable or why are crypto assets valuable, the answer some have given in our space, and I totally get it, is that they say it's because there's so many resources that go into the production, uh, so much expenditure associated with mining, so much work, and that work is expressed in the price. So, You've probably all heard this, and maybe you've used it. Um, the fact is that that's false. Work alone does not create anything of value. You know, if I sat in my backyard for weeks and made a thousand mud pies, that doesn't automatically give those mud pies a market price. It doesn't make them valuable. Just because I'm expending resources, where I talk all of you in this room to making mud pies, no matter how much work we put into something, that's not going to make it automatically valuable. It's, it, it, things are not valuable because of resources are, are put into them. It's because something is valuable that you're willing to expend the resources to create them. You see? The causation runs the reverse. So you should avoid that explanation. So what is the underlying explanation of the value? And I'm gonna go through three parts here, to, even though I've got like a handful of minutes here, but I'm gonna talk about this valuation, and I'm gonna talk about the purpose, and I'm gonna talk about the, the dangers. So on the valuation, what is the underlying value of Bitcoin? What is the reason it's valuable at all? Now, I did not know in the early days. I was looking through my email the other day. I found an email from 2010 in which a gentleman Named Satoshi, no, that wasn't his name. Uh, <laughs> a guy, I actually wrote this guy back and I said, hey, are you uh, Satoshi? No. He promised me he wasn't. 2010, he sends me an article for publication. And it was about this new thing called Bitcoin. And it was a pretty coherent explanation. I remember reading it at the time and not understanding a word of it. And I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you what my response was. I wrote him back and I said, I'm sorry, I can't publish this because this would be amounting to the endorsement of a product. 
interesting response. I thought it was, you know, like a Nike tennis shoe or something like that. I just thought it was a product. I didn't, I didn't entirely understand. It took me years to figure it out. Uh, the, the story is this, the first iteration of the realization of the underlying value of, of Bitcoin is this. Um, we have been used to, basically for all time and all history, a separation between the medium of exchange and the payment systems. And this is how we've all lived. You know, we've got Visa and, and we've got dollars. We've got uh, MasterCard and PayPal and we've got Euros and Yen. And those are all entirely separate. One has a value, the other has a value. Within Bitcoin, within uh, crypto uh, currency markets, those two are united into a single thing. And I think that's the, the, the one of the many critical innovations of this space is to bring those two things together, which we never thought was possible before. And one of the reasons we didn't know it was possible, and this is interesting, money has been technologically stuck uh, for about a century. Like nothing's happened to it because it was frozen in place and na basically nationalized by all governments and central banks in the world. And it just frozen. It's like we found the perfect money, freeze. You know, it was like if the Model T was the perfect car, you know? And we just said, that's the kind of car we need, and everybody drove it forever. And then one day, some dude drove up with that Maserati that's out front, or Lamborghini out front. <laughs> this is our new car. That's what basically Bitcoin is to money, okay? So it's just an amazing innovation that unites a payment system together with Bitcoin. And people forget this. It was not always the case that Bitcoin had a value. Uh, you can look back at the blockchain, which is fun. It's fun to look at the old blockchain, right? It's like reading great history, you know? So Genesis block, trade, 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 trade. Nothing happened until that magic day of October 5th, 2009, where there was the first posted price of Bitcoin, which I think was something like 1 16th of a penny. On that day, if humanity had been wise and smart, we would have realized that the concept had been proved. It was done. We were finished. It didn't have to go to $10,000. It didn't have to go to $20,000. It didn't have to go to $2 million. We knew already that it was possible to type on a machine and make a money. Unbelievable. You know, as a person with an economics background, I didn't think it was possible. I realized in 2013 it was possible, mainly because of the unity of the payment network and the scarce monetary good and the uh, hacking of the digital world to scarcify m money um, on the blockchain. Amazing. In retrospect, it seems obvious. And yet, I still don't think, so that's, anyway, some, in, let me just kind of give the elevator pitch. Why is Bitcoin valuable? Uh, because it provides a service. That's it. It's not any more complicated than that. It provides an important service. That is the use value of money. In the old days, economists used to say money could only come into existence uh, by, uh, by one of two ways. Uh, the state calls something money, and then they tax you, and then you have to get it, and that imputes value to it. I don't believe that that's true. But the second theory is that money comes out of barter. So something has to exist as already valuable, like gold and silver, or, uh, or, or stones on the island of, of Yap, or uh, salt, or whatever it is, and then it's, it's gradually valued more and more to the point you acquire it not for consumption purposes, but to trade it for later exchange, and that value of the initially bartered commodity is imputed to the new, new money. That story doesn't seem to work very well with Bitcoin unless you understand that the use value of Bitcoin is not bound up with a commodity, but rather a service. If you understand the service of Bitcoin, which you could say is a payment system, but it's more than that, then you understand the value. So, uh, just very quickly on, on, on this point. Um, uh, what, you know, what is the service value? And I think we've heard a lot of this at this conference. It's this, that Bitcoin allows you to bundle up into immutable packets any kind of information good you want and port it peer-to-peer -to, -peer to anyone else in the, in the world, any other node in the world, in a way that it disregards any kind of geographic uh, uh, proximity and, and, and have that with certainty arrive at the other port. 
That's an amazing thing. It's never been possible in human history. If you don't think that's valuable, you don't understand information economics. So there's that. All right, I've got very little time left. I'm not going to be able to get to uh, uh, my, my third point, but let me, just say, uh, let me just say this. I work for the American Institute for Economic Research. It was founded in 1933. A very interesting thing happened in 1933. FDR came along and destroyed the money. He shut down the banks, and he said to everybody, you can't get your money for a period of days. That was weird. Then he confiscated everybody's gold. By force of law, with a $10,000 fine, if you own gold, you have to turn it into the federal government. A lot of people didn't comply. A lot of people were prosecuted. A lot of people spent a lot of time in jail and got pillaged for failing to obey this order. A third thing he did was he devalued the currency from 1 20th of an ounce to 1 35th an ounce of gold. That was an unbelievable trauma. Right here in the United States of America, E.C. Harwood, the founder of my institute, said enough is enough. If the people don't have control over their wealth and can manage it themselves, the people are not free. Right? <laughs> not free. Not free. And do you know how people responded? This is fascinating to me. They hoarded. They hoarded. For 15 years, they hoarded. They didn't trust the banks anymore. The money went into the mattresses, it went underground, a lot of people kept their gold, they buried it, and the savings grew, and they grew, and they grew. The depression didn't end throughout the 1930s, the World War II came, people hoarded more and more. You know what happened after World War II? All the experts said there was going to be a depression. Millions of soldiers were coming home from Europe, there's going to be widespread unemployment, a new depression was going to come, it didn't happen. And you know why? Because people hoarded because the savings and the capital that was put together over the course of those 15 years formed the basis of a new prosperity and the greatest period of economic growth in the history of the world right here in the United States because of the defiance of the American people. Let me tell you, my friends, we've got a lot of hodlers here. There's going to be a beautiful, there's a beautiful future. You are the future. It's going to happen. Thank you very much, my friend. Yeah.